Came out the grave on the gravy train. Off the rip, gotta live his name. His grace and his mercy available if you've been stuck and don't know how to ease the pain. I'm eased about it like major pain. Wish that gospel like Nova Kane. The world is a lie, see my God do not lie. If he said it, that's that, let him never change. I was on jiggers and feelings way back before backwards was trending. Before Jesus re my living. The father stepped down just to give me. I'm grateful he did it. Now I walk around with his face. The melody is just a masterpiece. I pray, take me as far as my faith. Let me believe. I think he mastered me. Jesus, the recipe. The gravy unlocking doors just like a master key. Why, why? Time is not a call. Hello, Vida Nation. Hey, what's up, guys? What's How up? are you guys doing? Um, I'm going to say hello to just a couple people today. We have a very full program. Um, South Unit in Orlando, which I had never heard of. We just started hearing from you guys. You must be the new tablet. Awesome. Um, Kenny Smith and the others in Norlina, North Carolina. Hello. And okay. thank you guys for watching and for your support. Um, and, um, I'm going to read a letter. Do you have anything that you, like any map pins or anything like that that you want to announce today Only or not? Only Rush City, Minnesota. We just got okay. a whole bunch of wow. new ones, but Rush City, Minnesota is a new one. Okay. So shout out, Minnesota. Right. And over there, CCNO, um, I, you know, you told your chaplain um, that you're watching uh, Sulema uh, Rosario, but now I don't know her last name now. I know her as Sulema Rosario. But anyways, um, we do know her <laughs> and um, I, I hope to get back to Ohio sometime to the jail and to the prison. All right. I'm going to read a couple testimonies, just the portion of the letter from Al Atmore, Alabama. Dear Real Vida family, Eve, Jeremy, Chris, Andy, Carl and Sam. I pray your new year has started out well. Thank you so much for the Christmas and New Year's episodes. They were so wonderful and brought joy to many lives. You guys are a blessing. I would like to give you a praise report okay. from here at Holman Correctional Facility, if you would allow. Awesome. First of all, I would like to point out that Mama Eve has been praying for access to death row and segregation to be made available to inmate ministers. Right. Well, this has happened Come here on. at Holman. Inmate minister Amen. Derek Perry has been able to bring the gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ to death row inmates, crisis cell inmates, and seggers every Sunday morning for the past couple of months. Wow. Man, that's exciting. Amazing. Mr. Perry has not only gained favor to be able to go to these areas, as I'm sure you all well know very well that very few ever get to enter, much less to bring the gospel. He also put together a food drive that made sure those less fortunate would have a happy Christmas. Wow. Awesome. He passed out food packages from donated items to these inmates while providing them with lemonade to drink. Very Derek cool. Perry is faithful in his sharing God's word from the pulpit as well. The inmate population came together to supply this blessings so mama eve your prayers have been answered awesome. and so you know and i don't think probably texas don't know that a lot of the other states they don't allow inmate pastors they, they didn't even have them and field right. ministers um a lot of the states to go back in there to minister to death row or right. um seg we call them seggers which what they call the shoe or lockup or max or in different states they weren't getting anything at all and so it, you know, it's been like our fives here and our seggers right. and they're getting to do that. Amen. And so we're so excited about that. We're praying for more and more of that. The more word of God we get to people, yeah. the more they're going to get saved, the more they're going to change. And isn't that what we want in the first place? Yeah. You know, so that one, and then there is one from Grady, Arkansas. Dear Eve, Chris, Sam, Carl, Andy, and Sam, greetings in the awesome name of Jesus from Barner Unit in Grady, Arkansas. I've thought about writing for several months now. I've been watching the video podcast via Securus podcast app and the Pando app since spring. There have been so many episodes over this past year where I wanted to write and thank you for what you said, songs you sang, the interviews, the testimonies that have been shared, and so much more. I have been encouraged by the words of life each of you speak to the incarcerated. The song I just can't give up now that even Sam saying several months ago mm. touched my heart deeply and reminded me of a song our church choir sang years ago another recent episode outlaw also touched my heart deeply i appreciated the testimony that both couples shared i didn't realize it at first but i happened to be watching the episode on what would have been my 23rd wedding anniversary wow. and you know it went with that yeah props to chris for the high quality production work that he does i was amazed to learn that all this was new to him. He handles the duties like a professional. Also, double the props to him for stepping out and singing that Christmas song. I heard it at first and was trying to place the voice and was shocked when he stepped onto the screen. That was a That's cool so surprise. Cool. Yeah. He, he'll appreciate this. I was chopping pickles. Yes. 
for a Barrick's <laughs> Christmas special spread while I was watching the Christmas Eve video. Come on. We all pinched in and fed around 45 wow. guys that That's afternoon. Cool. That's awesome. It was great. And yeah. everyone had plenty to eat. Awesome. I love this, awesome, you guys. Yes. And, yeah. and they're doing it, units and people in greater numbers. And you find... The blessing is in giving. It is more blessed to give than receive, the right. Bible says. And it's an absolute truth. Yeah. It's an absolute truth. When I lived in Florida, we just, we didn't have, you know, we didn't have, and um, we were eating once a day already as it wasn't, but there was this kid that would show up at my house, you know, from, I, I lived in the hood and um, he didn't have anything to eat, you know, most days. And so he, he, he learned he'd come around dinner time. That was the only time we could eat. We were eating once a day. <laughs> And um, I would end up giving my food to him and not eating that day. Um, but it, but I had joy, right. you know. I had joy because I was, I was able to give. It is more mm. blessed to give than to receive. Yeah. And and until you're doing it, you you may not quite know that joy. But I'm telling you that if you'll try it, you'll see. You'll try it, you'll see. Um, I'm I'm going to testify of of one guy, a segger right now. Um, Come on. Who has been giving so much away. And I've even said like, slow down. Like you don't have to give everything away, you know, don't do it. But he's been like stepping out in faith. And so January came and he said, I, I decided I'm going to go harder. I'm going to do more. Wow, wow. And and decided even like giving commissary, you know, money towards the, these things or, you know, investing them in the kingdom. And um, so I, I was a little, a little worried. Well, he got blessed. Okay. He needed a radio and he didn't have one. And he was thinking about buying one and then he didn't do it. Well, somebody showed up and said, Hey, I got, a, I got an extra radio. Wow. He got, he got the radio. And yeah. then, um, he found out he's going to get a, the stimulus check he tried for two years ago yeah. and just let it go. And now he's going to get it. Come on. I mean, like all these miracles are happening for him because you can't, you can't out give God. Right. And I'm still not saying give all your stuff away, but I'm telling you that when God moves on your heart yeah. in a specific way and says, give, you, you can't outgive him. Right. You just can't. Yeah. And so he's seen so many miracles in his life and it's just such a beautiful, amazing thing. Yeah. Uh, so I do want to shout out uh, Holman Correctional in Alabama that yes. you were just reading that letter. And we are already in conversations with the chap there to hopefully oh, come cool. and visit Holman Correctional. He reached out to me after I reached out to okay. him. So we're working on it. We hope to come That's to Alabama awesome. this summer. Um, and we've got other units coming up. Hodge Unit, January 27th. Polunsky, February 11th. Clements Unit, February 25th and 26th, Boyd Unit, April 13th, and Michael Unit, May 25th. Awesome. Uh, we've got other ones in the works, but those are all we're at liberty to disclose, awesome. everything else. And you know, these guys, everybody's got a calendar. I'm, I'm not very good at the calendar thing. You know, they're all online looking at their calendars. Right. <laughs> and I am on the page looking at the big calendar on the desk, right? Because I'm, I'm, I'm so old school. Keep it old school. <laughs> but so, you know, where you see here, he's t saying we're talking with uh, Alabama Alabama, Home right? And, and, yeah, and right. I didn't, I didn't even know, yeah. right? You know, because we're all doing such different things. Sometimes, a lot of times, right. we're finding out right. what someone else is doing on the podcast <laughs> because we haven't had time to talk <laughs> right. about it and we're all so busy doing this, but we love it. Yeah. And um, this is the only ministry, like, I'm so glad that God saved the best for last. Come on. Um, you know, because I've done so many other things for seasons in my life. Mm. Um, but this definitely is the best for last and I'm so glad for it. I'm so excited about our guest today. And as I was praying and getting ready yes. this morning, uh, God gave me this scripture uh, and I got it in the New Living Translation, which is what I typically read and study. And I read it to Eve and she's like, is there another version that's better? And I looked at the message version and it's definitely better. It's pretty juicy. Okay, so First Timothy chapter 1, verse, uh, verse 15. Here's a word you can take to heart and depend on. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. I'm proof. Public sinner, number one, it says. Public enemy, Come number on. one, of someone who could never have made it apart from sheer mercy. And now he shows Amen. me off evidence oh, of his endless wow. patience awesome. to those who are right on the edge of so trusting cool. him forever. Isn't that's that so, so cool? cool. So, I love that. That's so great. God's going to yeah. show a sinner off today that yeah. got saved by grace. Amen. And we're <laughs> so on. excited about it. So there's so much, you know, we have talked to Sambo before. I mean, we could go on and we did for hours. Um, so we were going to try to extract, you know, pieces of his testimony and things. First of all, just welcome, Sambo, man. Thanks for having me. Man. It's a blessing. We're, awesome. we're so excited blessing. about it. Um, so we're, we're going to just start out with right away, like, you know, your childhood. Could you tell us how you grew up? What was life like? difficult. That's that's the word that I would use to do, to define my childhood. You know, sometimes that um 
the social and economic situations that some of us grow up in. Right. Um, I don't think no child should have to endure yes. that. Even though inside of my home, you know, the love existed. My mother, she raised five kids on her own. She was a single mother. And um, to grow up under them type of circumstances, you know, it's it's very difficult, you yes. know, for a single yeah. mother to do so. So, um, you know, I, 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 I witnessed the burden you know, I witnessed the abuse that she had to endure, um, the economic strain on her as well. And then all the other moving pieces that come along with trying to raise a family on your own in that, in that particular environment. I grew up in Southeast Houston and um, one of the most underserved communities in the city of Houston, uh, the, one of the most crime ridden, gang infested uh, neighborhoods in the city of Houston. Uh, so as I, I followed a predictable pattern you know, I got involved in the streets at a very, very young age, at about nine, ten years old. It became my sanctuary, the streets. The dope boys, the gang members, you know, the hustlers, they became, you know, my, my father figure, like most of us, you know, that have did a lot of time in prison. Um, they became the individuals that I idolized, that I looked up right. to. And I naturally, you know, f fell right in, right in sync with them, followed them, links, you know, right behind them and everything that they did. But uh, there was something about me in particular was that, you know, I had a different drive, a different ambition. You know, it was like everybody else's pain was my pain. Yeah. Mm. And then, you know, at yeah. some point my pain became everybody else's Come pain. On. It was a, a, a mm. perpetual cycle yeah. that, yeah. that existed in my life. You know, um, it was repetitive, you know, right. throughout the entirety of my life. But early on, um, that's what happened to me. It was like every every negative factor that a young man at a young age can experience in terms of uh, neglect, rejection, right. uh, verbal abuse, whatever the case may be, it, it began to, 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 to make me numb. Right. And, and so I hit the streets. Okay, and so you accepted. told us a, a little while ago, I asked you, how did you, how did you get to know SPM? Because I know you, you, you hooked up with SPM and you told me a little, a little bit about that. Can you share that with them? I was homeless. Uh, at a very young age, I left home because, you know, there's so much going on at home. So in order to find my peace, you know, I hit the streets and um, I was living in a, a pipe yard off a street called Chaffin in southeast Houston. And uh, Carlos SPM, he lived a couple of blocks away from it. Him, Grim, uh, Shadow and all them. They were they were childhood friends. They, they you know, they were all involved in the break dance and the music. And, um, you know, I just naturally gravitated towards them. Right. And, you know, he would allow me to come in his house and yeah. eat and they would feed me. But the streets is where I was at, you right. know. The things yeah. that they were doing with the music, exactly. I kind of shunned it because I was trying to survive. Right. They had their they had their comfort of, the, of their homes. They had the stability of their homes. I had the streets. Yeah. So that's where that was my sanctuary that's where I was surviving at the time on the streets and you know whenever they see me they embrace me right and you know I see like because we have talked to you and and this you have you have such a soft heart which you know if somebody just seen your exterior they they would they couldn't guess it you know mm -hmm. um you were always a leader I think SPM was always a leader we I was always a leader. Uh, we were just leading for the wrong causes, leading the wrong things, but you were always that. And so, you know, you mentioned like having that soft heart, um, yourself kind of an empath, you know, feeling other people's pain. And then, um, you know, that turning around, um, because if we're not, if we're not healed from all that hurt, it turns into lashing out into bitterness and um, doing some of those same things. But under that exterior, that heart of God, has always been there. You were always yeah. marked. His hand was always on you. And so um, you can very clearly see that mm -hmm. through your life. If, if anybody talks to you very long, um, you can see that there was always a heart for those that were broken. And um, so we'll get into that in a, in a little bit. And so so when was the first time like that you were locked up? And 
I'm going to put it to you this way. You're talking about physically, right? Yeah. Because psychologically, you can, be, you can be locked up as well. Yes. Starts Spiritually, there. you can be locked up as yes. well. There's some people that are out here that are in a deeper prison Absolutely. For than sure. what I was when I was in prison for yes. 30 years. Yes. So, you know, sometimes you, you'll hear this on the streets. They'll say we were born into it, not, st- not sworn into it. Yeah. And that's my story. I was born into it, right. you know, and, and, and not to use it as no crutch, but the opportunities really didn't present themselves to me. Right. You know, that was just the environment. That's just where I lived. That's just how I grew up. And people missed it. Yeah. They missed my potential. They missed yes. they missed yes. my ability to be more than what I was at right. that particular moment. And what happens is what happened with me at a very, very young age is because, like I said earlier, that my pain became everybody else's pain. Right. Right. And uh, I got a hold of the gun. You know, and violence was my thing. I've never had problems with drugs. I've never had problems with alcohol. Mm. I've never had problems with um, womanizing or anything of that nature. My thing was always violence. Mm. But, you know, like they say, those who hurt the most hurt other people the most. Right, right. right. And that's what happened to me. Right. But I became a prisoner of my own image. Right. My reputation preceded who I truly was, who God had called me to be in terms of my purpose, my God-given purpose. But as I've come to learn is that, you know, the adults that were around me, they missed it. Right. You know, I fell through the cracks because, you know, now uh, in regards to some of the things that I've accomplished, you know, it was already inside of me. Like you said, God had his hand on me from the beginning, from the onset. It's just that, you know, sometimes the streets just pull us so far in that, you know, all praises be to God that I made it that he rescued me when I cried out to him. But there are so many more that have not made it, that are still exactly. trapped in what I refer to as the invisible maze. Yeah. Right. And as you can hear, as you hear him talking, um, the intelligence is is incredible. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you yeah. know, he's so intelligent and right. I mean, even with words and, and all that. So people don't realize um, when you're when you're born into it and, and there's this brokenness all around you and there's no there's no way out and there's nobody seeing you or mentoring you or there, you know, then you end up in this place where you don't belong, but you're still right. the same person. Right. And not you know? just the intelligence, but a drive for excellence. Right. right. And so when you don't have any model, but this one thing, right. then you get in that model and you, you strive for excellence. You go 100. Right. So one of the things you're talking about, like um, God's hand was on your life. And we always like to ask, so was there any God in your life at all as a child? Did you know anything about God? Was there someone in your life that knew God that you knew had a relationship with him? No. The only the only time I knew anything about God, in, you know, per se, was when we had to go to a funeral. Mm. When one of my friends got wow. killed. Other than that, um, God was almost non-existent. I mean, in terms of the the the, the traditional yeah. facet of it, the traditional manner of God, getting up, going to church on Sunday, you know, and, and that's what I do now. I make sure that that's a common place in my home, prayer in the morning with, with my kids and my wife, awesome. church on yes. the weekend, church functions during the week. Right. You know, it, it has to be evident, you yeah. know. And she's not here today um, because she had something else to do. But that's a story I wanted also. She waited for him for 26 years. Wow. His <laughs> wife waated for him Man. for 26 wow. years yeah. um, and, and loves him and is a faithful wife. And it's amazing, you know, yeah. so it can oh, be done. Man, that's amazing. Um, and oh, I man. do know several, but not many that have waited for that long. Um, but amazing. God certainly put this together. And so yeah. so we do want to talk about when, did, when you went to prison. You did a long, long stretch. When did you go to prison? Was it only one time that you went or were you locked up over life for a while? Well, I went to prison for three years the first time okay. for a shooting case. I, I shot somebody and um, got out for six more. I stayed out for six months and then got caught up in a, a drive-by shooting. And um, it was a case that that I was not the, the perpetrator of the crime. I didn't right. do it, right? but I got caught up in it. And because I didn't tell on nobody, you know, I didn't give up who it was or take the stand on nobody. I wind up getting charged with the murder and um, spending 30 years in prison. Yeah, 30 years in prison for it. But, um, you know, the Bible tells us that God will take the, 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 the small things of the world to confound the wise. And I think that's what happened in my case. You know, even though I had to go through it, you know, I grew through it. 
And prison saved my life. You know, a lot of people, you know, that are in prison, you know, they're very bitter. They're very angry. But one thing that I learned out here in the free world is that we don't have the time that's allotted to us while we're incarcerated. So I took advantage of that, you know, like at the the last 10 years of my incarceration. I, I took advantage of the time that was given to me right. to build my relationship with God, to grow internally and to help other people that were in my same situation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because, you know, there's a lot of people that are incarcerated that that do not have any form of hope. Yeah. And the hope that I received came through my relationship Amen. with Jesus Christ. Yes. And um, some people may shun it that are incarcerated because they say it's just, you know, prison talk, prison religion or whatever, the jail religion. But if you really, really apply yourself, the fruits are evident. Yeah. You know, like the Bible tells us that they'll know us by our fruits. But it doesn't come easy. Anything meaningful in life doesn't come easy. And so while I while I was incarcerated, the same the same willingness to sacrifice for when I was in the game, I applied it to my relationship with Jesus and changing my life. And so I bear I bear the fruit of that now. Amen. But it Amen. wasn't easy. It okay, wasn't so easy. I want to go back. I, I we need to get some of this stuff. Um, you know, you went in with this bad rap um for 30 years flat. And you were not serving God at that time. So the first 20 years were, um, you know, tango. And so you were involved in the the founding of tango. How how long ago was that in the founding of tango? And um, tell well, I was, us about a, that. I was a hardcore gang member on the streets. Mm. Yes. So my reputation carried over into the prison yes. system when I got there. That's that's how it works. You know, people, mm -hmm. you know, everybody's yeah. always prospecting. Everybody's always right. trying to pick people up. You know, it's a subculture, but they have their own method of communication. But it's like anything else, you know, word on the street, it, it, it spreads. But so when I got to the prison system, there was a big change, a big transformation going on when I got there. You know, you have... Um, you have these prison gangs that exist in right. prison. They've been there for, for decades. And uh, some of the most violent groups, you know, that, that have ever existed. You know, I, I refer to it as modern day tribalism, right? Yeah. Mm. But it's, you know, we're just being used as an instrument, right. you know, by the enemy, by the devil to, to divide us, to create havoc and confusion and conflict amongst, you know, God's children. So, you know... I knew what suffrage was because I, I endured it as a child. Yes. But I also knew what survival was. Yeah. You know, and I thought that, you know, I was doing something that was righteous mm -hmm. when I began to form and structure, you know, the gangs, the Tango right. Blast. And in a sense, if you look at it, you know, you, I could sit here and try to justify it all day long. But... God has called us to bring forth life. Come on. You know, not yeah. not 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 to masquerade it as truth, but right. to actually live in the absolute when it comes to truth. And the only way that you can do that is by doing his work. We've been called to build and not destroy. But the formulation of this particular criminal organization, you know, it stood on certain principles, you know, in terms of uh, protecting the people standing against anything negative, you know, in terms of any oppositional groups. And so the people began to rally around us because they had been oppressed for so long. Right. You know, mm -hmm. extorted, raped. Right. Um, it, it was just, it was, it was a common occurrence. Yes. But I knew that it was an injustice. I knew that, that some of the things that were going on weren't right. So me and a few other brothers, we just banded together, yeah. you know, to so far to, to so-called protect the people, right. you know, those that were being oppressed or those who were being victimized. And um, the people began to rally around us because they were tired. Right. You know, they were tired. And um, we began to formulate and structure and begin to mobilize and implement and execute and... And, you know, but, but like you said, like of your 
your childhood, I was hurt and I felt the pain and then it turned around and they begin to feel mine, you know, right. and that's what happens even with the gang formations. It may have started, okay, so we can protect, so we can be safe, so we can, but then right. it turns around sometimes, you know, well, and, and that's what time. happens. Okay. All the time. Right. right. And right. so, okay. So you were blasting for 20 years and then, um, God comes in your life somehow. Can you tell us about that? Where, where you find God or finally surrender to him? I just woke up one day and realized that I was being part of the problem. Mm. When in turn, when I first began, you know, gang banging at that level, it was to be part of the solutions. Yeah. Because if you wake up and you have the burden of almost the entire prison system on your shoulders, right. not only in prison, but outside as well, um, a, a, a level of conviction will come. You know, if you, yeah. if, if God's if, if God's been working on you on the inside, and I know that there are brothers out there right now that are wrestling with the same yes. thing right. yes. that I yeah. was wrestling with back then, that they have a calling. You know, there's a, there's God's tugging at their heart, yeah, and He's calling them up out of that, yeah. and a bunch of them feel as though they're trapped. That there's no right. way out. But this, the Bible tells us that wherever the spirit of the Lord dwells, there's liberty. That Jesus right. came to set yeah. the captives free. Right. And so I just surrendered my life to God. I was like, Lord, if there is a way out, make a way out. Wow. I trust in you. And the way I was, was I was always, a, you know, you had to make me a believer. The only way that you could tell me that you was real was that you you had to kill me, basically, when I was living the gang life. Yeah. So when I came before the Lord, it was like, okay, God, you know, you've been tugging at my heart all these years and I've been thinking I'm doing the right thing, but I'm really not. Mm. You know, I want to live in a manner that's truly righteous. I want to truly be part of the solutions as opposed to Amen. part of the problems. Right. I want to be reflective of what it means to be a real father, to be a real husband. Yeah. I, I, I want yeah. that to be my example because I'm tired. Yeah. Because I'm tired. You know, you said that God was tugging on your heart. And I know that you didn't grow up with it in church, but I'm sure that while you were in prison, you began to be exposed to the gospel in different ways. And so uh, can you tell us a little bit about the ways that God tugged with your heart during that first 20 years when yeah, you were was in there the anyone, game Was there anyone, like a person yeah. that was instrumental in it? Or, you know, did you go to the chapel? Um, did you hear on the radio? Like what things? Yeah, there was maybe, I mean, it was very... During this time in prison, there wasn't a mass movement. Right. Like there uh, there wasn't now. an outpouring yeah. of the spirit. Yes. You may have had one guy on the unit that they called Preacher Man. Yeah. On the whole unit, on the yes. entire wow. unit. <laughs> yeah. But um, there was one 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 volunteer chaplain in particular. His name was uh, Trigger Rogers. And he's uh, He was uh, operating out of the Hughes unit. And um, he was very, very instrumental in making me reflect. Okay. making me take an introspective look in my life because he never judged me. Yeah. He never ridiculed me. Yes. He always loved me unconditionally. Awesome. And um, he always reminded me that I had potential to be more than what I was at that particular moment. Mm -hmm. And up to that point, I mean, you have to look at it, the stabbing cases, the riot cases, right. the lockup. And... Um, even if I stumbled and I fell, he went to lock up or solitary to wow. meet me. He never gave up That's on so me. Cool, so, you know, I, I'm very, I'm, I'm one of them type of individuals that I understand the depth of accountability. Yeah. So if you invest in me, you know, like I share quite a bit that the greatest investment we can ever make is in another human being, right. not in something monetary. Yes. And he invested in me. And I take that example and, and I run with it nowadays. You know, that's what I do. I invest in people. But, you know, he never gave up on me. But there were other brothers that were very instrumental as well as I began to grow. Okay. Mm -hmm. As I began to go, they didn't have no field ministers back then. But there was a few brothers that had already made that conversion. My biggest thing was, my reservation was that I've been involved in this gang stuff all these years. I surrender my life to Jesus. Will I be received by the guys in the chapel? Right. Wow. Will I be received by mm. the chaplains? Will the staff accept me? Come on. Because you become public enemy number one, like the scripture says. Yeah. And you begin to have those reservations. When I got out of the gang life, I went in the cell with five inmates and, and, and fought all five of them. 
you know, as opposed to just walking away and, and saying, oh, uh, it's, it, walking away and just being like, well, um, I'm going to leave with a clean slate. I felt like based on the gang rules, you know, that this is the only way to do it, to have a true clean slate like Daniel and the Lions did. And God mm -hmm. protected me. I could have won. I could have ended up dead, dead or yeah. very, very hurt. Right. Yeah. But when it was done, it was oh. done. It was over with. And the burden was lifted off of me. You know, instantaneously, I felt free. Like, okay, now that chapter of my life is closed. Even though the last chapter of my life hasn't been written, right. mm. I know I'm moving on to the next one. And thank God, um, right now, in great numbers in every gang all over, all over the United States, um, We've hit on that, you know, pretty hard of, you know, if it, if it's your younger brother or your uncle or your father, um, do you want that same thing for them? And all the time they write me and they're like, my little brother might go to prison. Please pray. I don't want him to come to the same footsteps or a father about my son or about my brother. You know, they have all these. Okay. So, so if, if we want better for them, this is also your brother in the gang. We want better for them. So when they're trying to give their life to God and when they're trying to do better, can we support them? You know what I mean? And, and, most and, so, organizations and they are do. now. Yeah, they most, are in big numbers. And, 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 you know, the level in which I was at, you know, within the gang culture in, in Texas, um, I had communication with all the hierarchy and all of them were tired. Yeah. All of them are tired. Who, who, who cannot be tired of being in administrative segregation for 10, 15, yes. 20 years? Yes. Who can't be tired facing life without parole? Who cannot be tired that's on death row? Right. Who yeah. cannot be tired that you're, mm -hmm. you're, the mother of your children don't want to take your kids to go see you because yeah. you're in seg? Right. Or it breaks your mother's heart to see you shackled and handcuffed. Who, yeah. When she goes to visit you, or you wake up in the morning and don't know if you're going to wind up dead or you got to put in some work. Yeah. Yeah. You know, everybody has their moment. The yeah. thing is, is like the Bible tells us, choose you today, blessings or curses, life or death. Yeah. And when, when God is calling, you know, the, he says, knock and the door shall be open. Yeah. You, you can't hesitate because if you hesitate, because the devil's always at work. He, you right. know, he roams around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Yeah. So you have to, you have to adhere to God's calling. And I know that there's brothers out there right now that are in AdSeg, brothers that are on the cell block right now. And not only are they tired, not only are they tired, but they're wounded. Come on. Yeah. They're frustrated. Yeah. They're angry. They're upset. But you know what? Because I, I, I'm, a live, I'm living proof of it. I'm a living testimony of it. Is that you're going to have to make that decision on your own. They have to make that decision right. on their own. Yes. But I know this. If you're sincere about it and you're truly crying out to God and you truly, truly want to change yeah. and you really, really want to be a good father... And a good husband, a good son, God's going to make that way for you. Amen. Yeah. But yeah. it don't come easy. Yeah. You know, right. In prison, a lot of us, we have this this fantasy, right, that that everything is instantaneous. Right. You know, and right. it's not. It, yeah. You know, God says, that's why he uses his illustrations in the Bible where he talks about putting your hand to the plow. Yeah. And how he talks about the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. He uses a manual labor analogy yeah because we have to put in the work but but i mean it, it breaks my heart right you know i mean i work with gang members right now i work for the office the mayor's office of gang prevention and intervention and i work with gang members on all levels active x uh, so forth and so on right and it just breaks my heart how the devil right he misleads us in a way that shortens our gifts, our calling, our purpose, our life, that creates so much conflict and confusion internally and externally within our families, right? And if there's any active gang members right now that are watching this podcast, that are, that are straddling the fence, that don't know whether 
they want to stay in or stay out. I would encourage, no, I would challenge you. I would challenge them to make the right decision, Come to on, send yeah, a, to it. surrender their life yeah. to Jesus. And, and it starts today. You yeah. don't put off what you can do today right. for tomorrow because right. the Bible tells us tomorrow is not promised. Well, like you said, they're tired. And Jesus said, come to me, those of you who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. But I, I want you to answer uh, the question that you said that you had. Uh, you said, my question was, am I going to be received and accepted okay. after yeah. after what I've done and, and where I've been? Uh, and, and so we know some things about your story, obviously, that God did uh, work things out. But why don't you tell a little bit about the story after you gave your life to God? Um, just talk about what God in the began prison, to what do happened in the prison, in the prison yeah. with you. Nobody believed it at first. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happened. I was, I was so embedded and entrenched yeah. in this particular lifestyle that um, it was like, say, I need a job, Major. Can you help me get a job? No, <laughs> no, not no. you. You're going to stay <laughs> on the cell block. Uh-oh. You know, hey, yeah. um. Come on, just give me a job. Like, can you help me move to the dorms? No, no. <laughs> but then I realized that, you know, it's a matter of action. Yeah. So, yeah, come on. Like we say, man, I got to get down to the chapel. I got to start. Yeah. I, I got to go to the Bible study. I said, no, I'm going to start the Bible study right here on G5. Yeah, come on. Yeah. Right here on G5, line three, yeah. uh, 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 level three, add seg. I'm going to start preaching in the day room and seg. Yes. I'm going to start going to the day room, having pray, uh, prayer circles and, and, and church services. I'm going to start man. being part of the solutions right there where I was at. So, you know, the administration is watching like, man, this guy must must have lost his mind, man. He (laughs) must have lost his mind. This is real. So, you know, I was able to bridge the gap because the way God used me was that I was able to minister to the active gang members, the ex-gang members. Mm -hmm. And while I was incarcerated and not many people are able to do that because of the stuff that I did while I was in the game, they received me. Right. Yeah. So they always knew I was a man of my word. So they knew. And I told them, I said, look, God has opened this door for me and I'm not going to forget about you, brothers. I'll never tell nobody to lay down their flag. I'll never tell them, you know, like, hey, you got to do this now. You got to. No, I'm not going to do that because I'm going to educate them about the consequences of their lifestyle. I'm going to share Jesus with them. But I want them to make that personal decision because when it happens... It's going to ignite a fire inside of them that no amount of money, right. no amount of influence, no amount of position, right. yeah. n- no amount of anything can fill. Because right when, when you receive Jesus Christ in your life sincerely as your Lord and Savior, right. when, you, when you know at that particular moment, you yes. know it's that time. Yeah. Right. That, know, that heart transformation. The heart transformation. Changes your outward. Come it's on. no longer a work that you have to. How and how many of us at times in your life, whether you know addiction to drugs, whatever things you're doing, like you're trying to be good, you know, and you're trying to do it on your own strength, and then it comes to an end all the time. And only mm. that heart transformation, um, by God, right, right, the renewing of the mind and changing you, that's what does it. You know, I was yeah. uh, so I started. I started. You know. I started doing what God had called me to do. He'd say, start a Bible study, start an art contest, feed the people on the cell Come block, on. Come on. stop the fight, stop the riots. Yes. Hey, man, yes. let's yeah. respect the staff more. I yes. started I started engaging yes. with the inmate population mm. and, the, and the staff started watching me. You know, they were like, man, this, 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 there's something going on with this. He works for us. Here. You know, <laughs> right. he's, he's really, really trying to make things yes. a better place. Yes. And and one of the things that, that the brothers that are watching have to know is that, because I used to run into this all the time, bro, I'm a convict. I know what to do. Right. No, either you're going to be a Christian Come on. or you're going to yes. be a convict. Yes. They don't coincide with each other. Right. Yeah. Either you're going to, God has set mm-hmm. you free psychologically, mm-hmm. yes. emotionally, and you're going to function as such. Right. Yeah. You know, like we'll be on a faith-based dorm and the guys will be like, well, I'm a convict. My celly, he needs to take his shoes off when he comes into the to, into yeah. the cell. Yeah. I'm like, look, brother, are you a convict or are you a right. Christian? Yeah. Yes. You know, which one is it? Exactly. Yeah. So we have to do away with that particular polar opposite right there, right. that particular mindset. So I just started functioning as though I was in the free world. 
Yeah. Filling out my, my requisition form. Yeah. Like Come that. on, I'm free. Together, yeah. Yes. Putting together yeah. all my schedule for the week, for yeah. the month. Yeah. You know, I, I started looking at things not as a, a, a just a unit artist or a painter on the unit that I was on. I was looking at them as though I was a project manager. And then I would get like the, the it, it was amazing because I was on the Stell unit. <laughs> And I would, <laughs> I would get up in the morning, right? I go talk to the major. Hey, major, how's it going? How's it going, warden? Uh, I got to go down here to to G fours. Mm. I'm gonna pull out ten crips today, and next week I'm gonna pull out ten bloods. Next week, he's like, "What? Are you crazy?" <laughs> I said, "Yeah, I'm gonna." But not only that, I'm gonna yeah. bring them over here to general population, and we're gonna paint the whole hallway. Come on, top to bottom. Man. We're gonna have our own lift at two or three o'clock in the morning, right? Yes. We, they've entrusted me with so much, right? And then, I, I, and then they'll come in for breakfast, and we're still working. They'll come in from mm. the next day. And we'll be in the ODR eating, sitting at the warden's table. You know, like, hey, what are you doing, man? Everybody's looking at us, but I'm like, look, this is something that God has called me to do. Yeah. And I took on a mindset like, okay, this is not prison anymore. Yeah. This The cell block is not the cell block. It's a city block. I'm doing a community revitalization project. Mm. And I'm showing the inmate population that they have an ownership stake Yes. And where they live. Absolutely. Mm. And yeah. I never made them a promise that I didn't keep. Yeah. And I always told them, hey, if they ask me, hey, I got you. You need a job. You need a, a case pulled. You need a, you need to get into a program. I got you. But you have to have a level of commitment to where I know that you're sincere. And though, even mm. though you may fall and stumble, I'm going to be there to pick you up. Right. I got you. Don't worry about it. And so, I, so what we're not showing and saying, right, but you're, you're seeing, I think, and hearing is, you know, he just started where he was, which was what I've told you yes. guys. G5s, don't wait on somebody. Right. Somebody no, yeah, get no. up. You, you be you be yeah. the minister. You know, right. you yeah. be the prayer warrior. You unite. And they are doing it. Um, but as... Sambo was doing this inside, they begin to take notice yeah, and right. they begin to allow him to do more and more and move him even from unit to unit to work right. with people because they're going to notice, especially when you've been the worst one on the block, <laughs> you know, yeah. they're going to notice and it is happening now in great numbers. And I encourage you guys that are watching mm. as you're hearing his story, this can be you, as, especially you, those of you that are saying, but, but Eve, like I've yeah. been the worst, I've had the most cases in this unit, oh, you know? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Especially you, right. yeah. that's who I'm talking to well, that's, because that's they see the, the change. Look, God has given so many people in prison, the anointing for leadership Absolutely, and they use yeah. it for the enemy. Yeah. His yes. kingdom, but that anointing comes from God, and, and just like Kiss Samuel, and Colin, you know, God gave repentance. you an anointing yeah. to lead. Then He pulled you out. And you know he did that. You know, I, I read the story of Joseph in the Bible, right? Mm. And you read these things, and you read about the freedom and the liberty that God gives you, the restoration, the redemption. Mm. You read it, right? And when you actually see it, because yeah. I went from the transition to the transformation in prison. Yeah. And I was never supposed to get out of prison. I was yeah. never supposed to get out of prison. I got 11 set-offs. I still had 327 months federal as well. And I had a wow. stack sentence for a stabbing case that I had as well. So, you know, I mean, murder, murder, attempted murder, attempted murder, aggravated on a police officer, stabbing cases while I was in prison, riot case. I was never supposed to get out of prison. But God opened that door for Amen. me. But yeah. the only reason he opened that door for me was because... I felt like I was ready. I didn't want to come out here half baked. You know, I don't yeah. want to come out. I was like, Lord, and I never asked God for anything other than the peace that he says that he'll give us that surpasses all understanding. Yeah. yeah. And I got to that moment. I had got to that point where I wanted to go home to testify before the world. I, I wanted to come home for that. Mm. You know, I wanted to show people out here what is going on in there because you have a lot of good brothers that have committed their life to Jesus right. and they're doing wonderful things in there, but the world does not know about it right. because all you see is the negative stuff on the news. So I'm like, Lord, if you open this door for me, yeah. if you open this door for me, I'm going to go to the free world and I'm going to testify. I'm going to show the world not only through, I'm not going to just, Talk about it. I'm. I'm gonna be about it. I'm gonna right. let yeah, my actions right. validate yeah. who I am in, in Jesus. And I've been blessed to stand before billionaires. Yeah. I've been blessed to stand before state officials, the governor, directors of various commissions. And I, the, the other day, I did a 
a Zoom call with 300 representatives from the United States Commission My on goodness. Immigration and Refugees wow. all wow. around the Amazing. world, right? Wow. So Amazing. And currently I work, <laughs> you know, I work for the mayor yeah. of Houston, yes. you know. Yes. And, well, uh, when yes. we get to that story okay. in just a second, but I, I just got to say, you know, I'm thinking about the fulfillment of your mission, right? Mm -hmm. And like, it's so cool to me. At first, you knew you weren't accepted maybe in the chapel because they didn't trust and right. believe it yet. But God gave you the gift of leading gang members, and the gang members aren't in the chapel. They're down in the cell right. block. Come on. And so God had you there. And, you know, Amen. we're going to get next to how God set you hold free. Hold on, hold on. There's so yeah. much to say. Oh, yeah, let me, let me touch ahead. base on that real yes. quick you about see? the yeah, brothers so in the much. chapel. Yeah. yeah. So I start going to the chapel, you know, and guys saying, oh, man, he's hiding out in here, you know. No. You know, <laughs> he, he don't want to be on the cell block. You know, he's getting some air conditioning, you know. But there was some strong brothers in there. Amen. Sure. You know, uh, yes. uh, Mario Ayala. Amen. You know, yeah. He was there. He's watching. Oh, yeah. He's out. Yeah. yeah. I, I love that brother. Yeah. He, he, he's seen my potential and he's seen my calling. Amen. And he helped cultivate yes. it early on. Amen. Yes. Praise God. Uh, and, and, you know, he was like, hey, don't worry about what they say. Don't worry. You just do what God has called you to Amen. do. Don't worry about what they say. And there was another brother. Uh, he's gone on to do great things for the Lord as well, man. And, and, and he told me one day, you know, I come to the chapel and he said, you know what it is, Sambo? You know what it truly is, bro? I'm, me and you, we're going to get to the, to, the, to the gist of everything right now. Yeah. You need to grow up. And it hit my ego hard. <laughs> I mean, hard, right? He said, you need to grow up. And like scripture tells us, you know, when I was a child, I acted as a child. I spoke as a child. But when I became a man, I put come away on, childish things. Come on. And the magnitude of those words right wow. there. So, you know what? I'm going to prove this brother wrong. You probably I, you weren't know. used to people talking to you <laughs> right. that way. So I said, man, me and you, we, we, you know, but I needed that. Yeah. Wow. And we had a relationship and he had, we had, he had built a rapport with me. Where he could correct me. He yeah. could talk to me. That's yeah. one of the That's things awesome. that a lot of the Christian brothers and sisters right. tend to do. They're more about correcting than counseling or Come building on. that relationship yeah. right. and um, or, or judging. Yes. And, and he came in and, and he had been working with me a couple of, couple of months and he said, hey, brother, you just need to grow up. That, that's what it is. You, you just need to become who you are, you know? And he started breaking down different dynamics of what maturity was all about, not only spiritually, but in terms of just being a man biologically at that particular juncture in my life. And I, I ran with it. I took a hold of that and I said, right. you know what? Okay. So we just went through a podcast on discipleship, you know, and constructive. The Bible talks about constructive criticism, that if mm -hmm. you can take it, then you can grow. Then you can reach the heights that you long to go, your own goals. Um, so, you know, we definitely need discipleship. And of course, it doesn't need to be in the right way. I wanted to address, you had talked about, you were never supposed to come home. And we're going to have another guy also um, soon that had stacked life sentences, wasn't supposed to come home. And there, so I want to hit two things with this. Um, the other day, I got a letter from a guy that was in the gang on the outside and, you know, they had a hit. He, he took it. He did it. So he's got a life sentence. He's never coming home. He's done stuff since being inside. So he's got more years on, on top of the life sentence. And he, and he says, I'm never coming home. So he's still in the gang and someone wanted to drop out. And so there were all the others around him and they were like, just let him, just let him go. And he was like, oh no, I gave my life for this. I'm not letting him go. Mm -hmm. You know, not, not that easy, not, not that way. And um, in that moment, I had already been in his life and I, I, it was months prior, last year sometime that I'd wrote and all of a sudden he was on my mind. And so I wrote him and he said, in that moment that he was going to go do this, a letter comes from Eve out of nowhere. And, um, and then, and then on the podcast, I mentioned their unit and said, are you being good? Like, be good. And he thought, oh man, like she talking <laughs> to me. She, this lady keeps popping up in my life right when, you know, um, but you know, I, I could see his feeling of, I gave my life for this. So no, you don't get to get out of it that easy. And he says, I'm not quite with God. You know, everybody else, he's like, you know, a lot of the writers are like, I've given my life to God and I'm not quite there yet. And that's okay. He's still loved by the Lord. You know, God yes. is still dealing with him. God is still touching him. But I wrote him back and I said, look, um, I don't know if you got it yet, but look, um, I hear in you that you've given up. I'm never coming home. 
but God has the ultimate say. Oh, yes. oh yes. You know what oh, I mean? Yes. And I love it that you said, and it's true that you should never have come home, but you'd given your life to the Lord and God has the ultimate say. And so that's what I said to him. I said, you're giving up too easy. You're putting your life in man's hands yes. and, you, and you don't know this miraculous God that he can bring you out, you know? And you can be so, so free even yes. in prison. Amen. Yes. My, my freedom came from my relationship with yes. Jesus, nobody yes. else. Yeah, come and on. And I don't think yes. that there'll be another another individual that's incarcerated in the state of Texas that will have the level of freedom that God had given me because I was the worst of the worst. I was the worst of the worst, you know, the chief of all sinners, like yes. Paul says. Yeah. And the relationships that I built with administrators, with chaplains, I was a peer educator. I used to do tear walking during the pandemic, right? Yeah. We probably had four officers on staff. But the warden came and got me and a couple of other brothers and was like, hey, man, I need you to help run my unit for the next couple of weeks, couple of months, whatever the case may be. Mm. But what I want to encourage the brothers to, to, to do is this, that as long as you're that example, as right. long as you're that example, yes, there'll be opposition. Yes, there'll be obstacles. But as long as you persevere, as long as you stay consistent, as long as you continue to do everything that God has called you to do in terms of the spiritual level and maturity in which you're at, and you continue to grow, people would take notice. Because I'm going to tell you, the administration on their unit, on any unit, they want brothers who are doing the right thing, Amen. not right. doing the wrong thing. They want brothers to get out here and engage with the other prisoners on the unit and to build something that's viable and sustainable right. Right. for the community. You know, whether you start a, a, a bingo game on your cell block, right. whether right. you start an art contest, a poetry contest, wh whatever the case may be, if, if, if they know who you are, the administration Amen. will get behind you and say, you know what? Right. Okay. Just keep walking it out. Yeah. Just keep walking it out. And, 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 yeah. and like they told me many times, you got one chance. You got one chance. <laughs> you got one chance. Wow. You know, but, you know, a lot of times we look at the administration as the enemy. Right. Mm. But we all, nobody wants to live or work in a hostile environment. Mm. And one of the things that I learned before I came home was that if you came on the cell block and you were problematic, the major the vast majority of the offenders on the cell block, they don't want that drama. They don't want the lockdowns. They right. don't want the gas. They right. don't want the riots. You know, so there's been a, a, a paradigm shift within the Amen. system because wow. God has pouring out his spirit. Years yes. ago, uh, there was a pastor that said that the greatest outpouring of the spirit in the end yes. times will come, come from on. the prison and system. Amen. You know, so we just have to help foster that. We just Absolutely. have to continue to help nourish that, right, you yeah. know, and, and, and allow God to use us in that capacity. But it's your cell block. Right. It's the brother's right. cell block. It's not yes. the warden's cell block. Right. right. You, you got to live there. If you want the, the cell block painted, if you want the food better, stop stealing the food out of the out of the, the chow kitchen. hall. Yeah. <laughs> if you yeah. want the cell block right. to be painted, right. send in requests to the administration and, and volunteer to do it. Right. You know, if you want the cell block to be cleaner, stop throwing trash over the run. Right. You know, and that was that's what I did. Yes. I, I help instill them type of actions yeah. in the prison population on the units that they, that I was on or that they transferred me to because I wanted the culture of the institution to change. Right. Because the label, the stigma that comes from being a, a, a prisoner mm -hmm. is it, it, really a false a falsehood. A lot of people don't, don't know that. Well, they don't even take into consideration that even Jesus was in in chains. Right. He was he was, you know, locked up. One yeah. third of the New Testament was written from prison. But yeah. people people out here, for the most part, they don't want to focus on that, right? Yeah, they don't want to focus on that. But there's a lot going on in prison that's that's positive. You know, we just have to continue to to help foster it. You know. Well, speaking of getting out of prison, uh, can you just tell us briefly? Because I know it's a long story, but <laughs> yeah. just explain how it came to be that you, with this life sentence, are sitting here with us today, and and working for the mayor, and working <laughs> we for the mayor, right. working with, we with get the mayor, to that too. yes. You know, I don't even think there's enough words in the, I know. In the I know. dictionary to put it all together. But what happened was, 
There was a man that watched me while I was in prison. I used to paint murals. And he watched me and he watched me. And he, I was working in the regional, regional medical facility in Huntsville on the Estelle unit. And he watched me for about three years. And one day he calls me to his office. He says, son, when are you going home? He was a director in one of the divisions. And I told him, I said, man, well, you know, as of right now, you know, I may never go home, you know, technically. He says, you ain't no, you're not no Christian. You're not no, you can't be a believer. You know, I see you walking around here ministering to the patients and to the, to the, to the free world personnel. But you can't be a Christian. See, you, you, you're only giving half the story. You're not, you're not believing in the whole book. And I looked at him and I, was, I felt convicted, but it was so, it was something that small, right? And he says, you ever heard of an attorney named Bill Hayburn? I said, yeah, he's a legend. Bill Hayburn, you know, he's, he's a legend. He fought for all kind of brothers in prison reform. That's how we have phones in the prison system and all this other stuff that he's fought for. And I said, yeah, he said, well, he's my best friend. Give him a call. Mm-hmm. I'm going to talk to him. Give him a call. Mm-hmm. And I was, I was like, what? So what I called my wife and I'm God. like, Lord, Man. I'm like, babe, you ain't going to believe this. Man. Bill Hayburn, right? He, this, that, and the other. So she calls him. He comes to visit me, 84 years old. Wow. He's sitting wow. in there looking at me in the visitation room. He goes, pack your commissary bags. You'll be home in a couple of months. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you should have never came to prison. Man. Just like that, he's looking at me, right? Wow. He said, you should have never came home. You should have never been to, sent to prison in the first place. So I call my wife and she's like... Are you serious? You know, because this mm. guy right here, he's legendary. Bill Hayburn, he's yeah. he's the greatest prisoner advocate that we've ever had in the state wow. of Texas for prisoners. So, I, it, it just, I get emotional yes. thinking about it. Yes. So, a couple of months later, let me just put it to you this oh, way. The whole wow. administration on the Estelle unit, the wardens, the majors, classification, they walked me out of the front of the prison. Wow. wow. God. Walked me out, shook my hand, said, hey, man, man, God bless you. Matter of fact, I went back to the Estelle unit last mm. month. I went wow. over there and, wow. and, and ate wow. lunch with the warden and them, wow. man. We had man. fried chicken and, 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 uh, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, yeah. and, and fried chicken and um, ribs. I didn't get to go into the chat. Apple mm-hmm. at that time, but I just went up there and had a meeting with yeah. him. So shout out to to Warden. Wow. Uh, That's awesome, man. Metcalf yeah. over there on yeah. the Stell mm-hmm. unit and yeah. Major Jordan, he left, but he he was there. All of them came out and greeted me and thanked me for the work that I did while I was there. Wow. But make it real small about Bill Hayburn. Yes. So I come, I, I walk out of the prison and I'm like, man, this can't be. <laughs> right? Like <laughs> it took me a few months, but I made it home and I was like, Lord, man, the Lord opened the door. But it was always that whisper that you said mm-hmm. you was gonna glorify me. You said you was gonna serve me. That's you said, right. you know, I took care of my end of the deal. Yes. So I get in the wow. I get in the truck and I call Mr. Hayburn. I'm like, man, I'm out. I touch the ground. Mm. And he says, My wife, she's nervous, she's shaking, my mom. She, you know, mm. because you go from you thinking you're never gonna come right. home. Wow. To being right there, you know, and it's literal. I, I, look, if, if there's anybody that has any doubt, there's a scripture in the Bible that says that Jesus came to set the captives free. Yes, he yeah. Did. And I'm one of them. He set come me on. free. I mean, I'm, yeah. right, I'm right here. I'm out here. I just right. drove four yeah. hours to come right. over here. Yeah. And I called Mr. Hayburn and he's like, I'm like, how's it going, Mr. Hayburn? I made it. I'm out here. He's like, well, you you there, right? You 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 okay? He said, it's no surprise to me. You know, God always works miracles. Mm-hmm. He hasn't yeah. changed. God always works miracles. And in the scripture that Jesus is the same yesterday, yeah. today, and forevermore. That's right. He mm-hmm. says, so what you about to do, son? Mm-hmm. I said, man, I'm going to Bucky's. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'm going to Bucky's. I want to go to yeah. Bucky's, right? So yeah. now I get home and, you know, me and my wife, you know, we, we are looking for a home church. And, um, you know, I see, I turn on the news every day. We have another youth killed by gun violence, another youth killed by gun violence, another elderly person, straight bullet killed. And there was this one particular case where a five-year-old, she was in the backseat of her car with her eight-year-old brother. Her mom had, had had to work two shifts that night as a waitress. She was at the stoplight in Greenspoint. No, not Greenspoint. I'm sorry, in Southwest. And they had a shootout in the uh, parking lot of the convenience store. And they shot her car up with an AK-47. The bullet hit her five-year-old daughter in the face, uh, Dior. Blew her whole face off. And um, she died in her brother's, eight-year-old brother's arms in the back seat. 
And he got shot also. And they're from Iowa. They're not even from Texas. They're not from Houston, you know? So immediately, you know, me and my wife, we jumped into action with some other brothers that own some restaurants and we did a benefit for them. And a highly publicized case. And after that, we did more benefits and more benefits. And But, you know, you have like the chief of police will show up. These other community activists, they show up. Uh, these politicians, they show up. Because everybody is up in arms like this stuff has to stop. Mm -hmm. This youth violence, this gang violence is at epidemic proportions. And young men and young women are losing their life before their time. They're not able to live out their God-given full potential. They say that the graveyard is the wealthiest place on the planet because most people die before ever living out their God-given purpose. Right. And because the devil's at work. So I just started calling people and, you know, I'm building this campaign. God's like, hey, do it. I got you. And I'm moving without any type of doubt. I'm calling these people, calling these people, leaving messages here, emails and phones and text messages. And then I get a call from uh, the mayor's office. And, um, um, you know, Victor Gonzalez, a lot of people know him. He's worked with uh, reentry and reintegration, uh, violence reduction when it comes to gangs in the city of Houston. He's like, you know, the top, top you know, yeah. uh, gang prevention, gang intervention specialist in the city. And um, he calls me, you know, I'm at home and my wife's like, you still there? I got paper everywhere at the desk. And she's like, you still reaching out? Mm -hmm. And he calls me and um, he's like, who is this? And I tell him, man, you know, this is uh, Sambo Gerardo from Southeast Houston. He's like, I know who you are. I know your case. He said, are you serious about giving back? I see what you're doing with the school drives, the backpack drives, helping people with their utilities. You know, you're, you're, you're really out here on the front line engaging with the community. And I really respect that. He, but are you serious? I'm talking about long term. You know, because a lot of guys get out and they have these grand schemes right. and, and they, they fall because reality, life hits them. Yeah. Mm. The bills, the, yes. the argument with their significant yeah. other, the, uh, the job opportunities, yeah, sure. temptation, distraction. I said, yeah, I'm serious. He said, well, come down to the city hall right now. Come down here to the annex building. Wow. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll buzz you up. And I, I was on a monitor. I was on super intensive supervision. <laughs> so I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't even go to my front yard or my backyard. So I called my parole officer. I'm like, hey, this guy right here, he's like, well, tell him to call me. You know, He calls him. I get in the car. My wife's like, I'm going to take you. Let's go. We go. We wind up talking for about four hours that day. Wow. And he's like, man, can you come back again? So we got to talking and got to talking. And there's more to what I was doing in prison when it came to right. peer education yeah. and uh, putting the work uh, yes. programs together. So we talked for about about six months. He interviewed me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was going wow. down there wow. every week, wow. <laughs> every week. And so one day he was like, you know, I hear everything that you're saying and you're spot on. I know you've been doing the work. I can tell by, you know, how, how you speak and what you talk about. Because I was working with the gang members in prison, you know. And he says, uh, one last thing. I'm, I need some reference letters. If you say you were doing all this stuff in prison, well, then I need some reference letters. And then I'll make my final determination if I can hire you here at the office. I said, we don't need no reference letters. We can call them right now. <laughs> I said, babe, call this unit, call this unit, ask for this mm -hmm. warden, that warden. Well, they were all out. It was like about lunchtime. Mm -hmm. And I said, let them know that Samuel Gerardo's calling, mm -hmm. you know. And so she called like four or five people. And uh, he's like, well, just I just need some letters, you know. And my phone started lighting up. They start calling back the wardens. Wow. They started calling back the directors of the Savori <laughs> program, the Serious Violent Offender Reentry Program. They were calling back the um, uh, uh, safe prison coordinators. All these people that 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 you know, I was working in these capacities in prison. The wardens and they all just start calling back. So we start putting them on speaker, and he's like, "Hey, man, I'm Victor Gonzalez from the Mayor's Office of Gang Prevention and Intervention." I work strictly with prevention and intervention and reentry. We offer various services. I want to hire Samuel, you know, because I think he'll be an asset to the office. And 
they were like, oh, well, we can't tell you about Sambo. We can tell you who Samuel, Samuel Jurado is, but we can't tell you who Sambo is because we never met that guy. That's or I cool. never met that guy. Yeah. Or that guy is long gone. So he was like, okay, well, that's all I need. And several of them called back. That's cool. And um, not only did he hire me, based on that interaction, he hired two other people, one that did 16 years and one that did Man. 20 years. Wow. So, so now I uh, I go out into the communities, high-risk, underserved yeah. communities, and I go into all of HISD, wherever there's a, 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 a incident of violence. Mm. We work, we mediate so with, the, uh, with, the, with the offenders, with the, with the students, the ones that either committed the, the shootings or the stabbings or the fights. We work with the administrators. I do w workshops, presentations. I mean, you name it, I, right. I, I do it. If it's about right. saving lives Come and on. I have Amen. the capacity of the office Amen. and the support of my supervisors. So we do s outreaches all over the city. We give out. We've Since I've been home, and I say this in the most humblest way, we've been able, I, I've probably serviced about 25,000 people in the city yeah. of Houston. A lot of the guys that are incarcerated that are watching this right now, if you live on the north side of Houston off of Tid Tidwell, Collinsworth, Homestead, um, I've probably helped somebody that you know in your area Amen. because we set up at the multi-service centers. We set up at the parks. Yes. We work real, real close with the APEC ministry and Powerhouse Church, Katie. Mm -hmm. They give me all of the non-perishable food items, so hygiene, clothes, anything that I need. They have a warehouse full of stuff. Yes. The director, Marco, he used to dream about having a um, warehouse full of dope. Now he has a warehouse full Come of hope. I call Come him on. up and I say, hey, man, I yeah. need uh, 500 boxes of non-perishable food mm -hmm. items. He's like, hey, come pick them up. Marco's, Marco Ruiz, strong, so strong, great, powerful man. man of God. Wow. And so what we do is we'll pull up in these, like in one apartment complex, there was five homicides there in one of the most powerful drug gangs in the city of Houston. This is their home base. Mm -hmm. uh, so we pull up in, in this particular apartment complex. And what happened was, was we worked at the schools, we worked at the uh, at the parks, and then we worked at the apartment complex, and then we went to the multi-service center. We dealt with the kids, the parents, then the grandparents. We put all that strategy together. God gave us the ability yeah. to see it for what it was. So now we go into the community, and it's like, hey, come over here. Hey, man, help us, you know? Yeah. Hey, man, thank you for what you're yes. doing. And we it took about a year to do, mm -hmm. but the relationships are strong and they're solid. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I mean, just... I have a client right now. These are the type of cases. If you got a if you got a child that, and you're incarcerated, and you're worried more about your homeboys mm. than your own children, then I, I'm gonna have to kind of like, you know, check you on that real quick right now. Not to give no details, but I have a client right now. She's 14 years old. She's HIV positive. You know, she was a, she's a former prostitute. You know, on one of the busiest uh, uh, strolls in Houston, Texas, 14 years old, and her dad is in prison. He's been in prison since she was born. So if you have any children, any of the guys that are watching us right now, or, or women, if you have any children that are out there, you don't even have to make the changes for yourself. Right. Make them for your kids. My dad right. died in prison, you know, in 1994. So... All the components are connected. So these right. are the cases that I work with. I had to bury a 12-year-old, a 14-year-old. And all. And for the most part, most of their dads are in prison. Yeah. You know, most of them are in prison. So we have to do what we have to do. And it's not even about us anymore. Come on. You know, it's not even about us anymore. I still eat Roman noodle soups and refried beans <laughs> and Come sardines. And black bag coffee. <laughs> That's not even black bag coffee. Yeah, shout out to the brother man out there that... Uh, brother brother Jeezy, he gave me 10 black bags of uh, coffee. He sent them to me the other day, man. Shout out to him. I really appreciate it. But the responsibility that God has given me, right? I could Come not on. fulfill the task without my obedience to his calling Amen. and to his instruction. Absolutely. You know, so, and, and, you know, I mean, I've, I've met with... I mean, it, it's amazing. State lawmakers, law enforcement officials, mm -hmm. uh, politicians, city council, principals. It's like, 
like we were sharing with 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 her earlier, any door that God opens, no man can shut. That's right. Yeah. You know, I'm here because it's a divine appointment. Amen. Yes. You know, to spread the gospel and to yes. tell people to testify what God has done for me in my life to inspire you yes. brothers out there to not. It, it, you don't have to decide right now right. that you're going to serve the Lord, but to take an introspective look. Yeah into who you are and what mm. you're doing right now. And I go to work like this, yeah. tat it up. And, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm right there at the City Hall Annex building. I pull up and everybody's like, okay, right. you know, how you doing today? You know, and I'm, I'm yeah. in the, the elevator. I'm at the, you know, I was, I was, I was at the tunnel eating the other day. And uh, my coworker's like, hey, Sam. Man, that chick's over there checking you out, man. She's checking you out, man. Hey, my, my co-worker, he's, you know, he's messing with me. And I was eating, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't want to say this because the brothers got the food they eat, but I was eating a brisket sandwich, right, and from Otto's uh, Barbecue. Mm -hmm. And um, I said, man, who are you talking about, bro? And I look over there, and it's my federal parole officer. So I'm like, hey, Gerardo, how you doing? Come here. Come here. I was just telling him about you, and she was telling, you know, this was a federal judge. She was telling him, wow. hey, I was telling him about yeah. your case. And, you know, so God will put you before Come on. people mm. Mm. that have the resources right. and the capabilities yes. to assist Mm -hmm. in the in the task that God has Amen. called you to accomplish while we're right. here on earth. You know, I mean, like the brothers at Yapak and at Powerhouse Katie, I'll call them and say, hey, man, I need... I mean, we're talking thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars in non-perishables, right? And they'll say, okay, we'll box it up. We'll put it up in there. You know, Marco's been very instrumental in that. The pastor, Robert Burgett, man, they, they just like... What it is, it's like, if you're spending more time on the pews... Come on. Right. But if you're Preacher. out here right. on the street on the front line, then right. I already know what it is that you're doing. Yeah. Like, you know, I'll run into a brother and he'll be like, hey, man, I ain't seen you at church this weekend. I'm like, yeah, because I had to travel all the way out there and share my testimony or we had an outreach You've program. You've been having church every day all week. Yeah. Right. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. So be a doer of the word. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Wherever yeah. you're at right now, if you're in administrative segregation, if you're on G5, if you're in G4, if you're G3, G2, wherever you're at right now, in Texas, California, if you're in Virginia, it doesn't matter where you're at. It starts right there. Come on. Yeah. Right there. And, do, yeah. and don't let fear paralyze you. A lot yeah. of brothers, right. are, well, what do they think? What do they think about me? Right. It's okay. Let them. I'd rather be known as a holy roller right. and a Bible thumper in prison, right. you know, than than a troublemaker. Mm. Yeah. You know? I, I was thinking about the name change, and the reason I picked that scripture from First Timothy chapter one because I knew you were coming about public enemy number one is when when Saul was headed to Damascus, he had death warrants. After he got a hold of God, everywhere he went, he was delivering not death warrants. He was delivering the word of life. Come on. And that's what God was doing in your life is Amen. he turned all of that around and he changed his name. And, you know, I, I thought it was cool because I've just known you, met you as Sambo, but at Samuel. Right, right. That's Samuel, what a beautiful and I'm thinking name. about the little what an boy name. in the temple that <laughs> heard God's voice right. when nobody Growing else. Growing up by the ark, That's yeah, right. near the Come presence on. of God. And so, meanwhile, while Eli was in charge, Samuel was growing. Man, I could preach a whole sermon. Ooh, yeah. Okay, so we're, we're we're basically out of time, but I do want to bring a few things out. You know, um, I I love what he said. First of all, I want I want you to be reminded that. Um, he he wasn't even looking for it, right? He wasn't even yeah. looking for a lawyer to get out. God brought it his way because right. he was doing the work of the Lord. Right. So yes. he was like David in the field. And so he had his preparation in prison. Yes. He was already doing the community work. He was already doing the painting. He was already bringing the gangs out. He was already loving people. He was already sharing the word wherever he could go. And so God employs those that are already working. Yes. So when he got out here, he just continued the work. It didn't right. start when he got out here. Right. It started there. As soon as he became a real Christian, and people are like that all the time, right? They're, um, I heard another lady say that the, the pastor's wife, like, you know, she's busy being the church. Right. I'm busy being the church. My, my nurse, you know, every nurse, every doctor I go to, they're watching the podcast. I mean, <laughs> they're hearing about the Lord. You know what I mean? They've yeah, already got that right. because I'm busy being the church in the doctor's office, being the church on the bus, being the church on the airplane, being the church with a neighbor. Like everywhere you go, that's your yes. mission. And, and people are used to going to have church. But, right. let, but yeah. we are the church. But let me right? share this with you real quick in closing. I know we're, we're limited in our time. 
a lot of people think that they can do it on their own. A lot of people. And, you know, I've always been a man of my word. So when I gave God my word, I gave my family my word. I gave my wife my word. I gave my daughter my word. Because all of, all of us in the game, they, we say we're going to stand on, on our word, right? And, you know, my wife, she'll look, she'll look at me sometimes, you know, like she's falling all in love with me again. Oh. Like, <laughs> like you, you, you're doing what you said Amen. you were going to do. Amen. Amen. But That's I'm cool. accountable to her. Yes. I'm accountable to my daughter because yeah. the ministry starts first at home. Amen. It Amen. starts there at yes. home first. Mm -hmm. And the men that have wives that are, that are, I know we haven't touched much on it, that are out here. Because we've gone back to the prisons and what they have to go through when they're waiting for somebody that's incarcerated. Right. I mean, the level of sacrifice is yes. beyond measure. It's yes. beyond measure. And, you know, I do everything in the world that I possibly can to show my wife how grateful I am. Mm. I mean, it doesn't matter what it is, what level of sacrifice that I have to make for her and our daughter, because that's what we're called to do, right? But you do it out of a sense of not obligation, but you do it because... Everything that God has given us, the unconditional love, right? We're, we're supposed to give it away. And she has to be the primary caregiver Amen. of that, the recipient yeah. of that. Right. You know, and, and, and last night, you know, I was on my way over here. I, I, we were talking about me coming over here. And she's like, it's, it's real big, Sam, what you're fixing to go do. You know, you're going to testify to the prisoners. You're going to be able to touch all these units simultaneously. Yeah. How do you feel about it? And I said, I wish you would come with me. Yeah. You know, I wish you would because I want people to know our story. Yes. You know, how much, you know, the phone bills. Yeah. The visitation, the money she had to spend on gas. Yeah. The sacrifices she had to make. Put on the books. But she committed yeah. to me when she didn't think I was going to get out of prison. Right. Wow. So she was ready for the, for the, for the long haul. to take my yep. body and put it in the ground. Right. You know, so I want to I want the brothers out there that do have significant others that are out here yeah. to always be mindful Amen. of the sacrifices that their yes. women make. And my wife is my best friend. She, yes. she I, I counsel with her before I counsel yeah. with anybody outside mm -hmm. of, of God. Amen. And we sit right there. And I mean, she's done put about 40 or 50 pounds on me since I've been home. She loves to cook, right? But we have to respect that. Amen. And I think that when you, when you, when you, when you get your, this is a common saying in the church, right? Your relationship with other people can, can, it allows me to gauge your relationship with God. If you have a good relationship with God, you have a good relationship with other people. Amen. Because he's our instructor, right? Yes. He's our example. And that's what I want her to see. I want her mm -hmm. to see Jesus in me, not Amen. just the accomplishments, right? Not right. just the right. monetary gain, right? The the, the the houses and the truck. I, I don't. I want her to see Jesus in me more yes. than anything. Yes. You know, and when I go to when I go to acting up, she's just like Securus. She says, "You got one minute left. <laughs> <laughs> you got one minute left." <laughs> Amen. Well, Amen. we're going to have to end it, but you know, we definitely want you guys to come back. You know, when you can. I know our. You know schedules are so so busy and you're doing so much for god and Amen. it's such an inspiration um to to us to see others that are doing the work too and being the church outside right. of the walls yes we need to go and get infilling i'm not saying don't go get infilling at church or at the chapel if you're in the in behind the walls but come out of the chapel with it yes right. and then take it to your dorm take it to your pod take it to wherever you're at and spread the love of jesus everywhere um that's what matters the most and so so uh, I'm, I'm sure you enjoyed this. We will have him and his wife, Samaria, back as soon as possible. And, um, you know, write and let us know um, how this has affected your life, um, if, if it has and, and what it has done to for you, in you. And um, we'll, we'll spread the love and let them know um, what you're saying about it. 
All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your mercy and your grace that all of us as the chief of sinners, God, that you changed our name. You You gave us a purpose. You gave us a reason to live. God, I just thank you for what you've done in Sambo's life and that you are reaching so many right now hearing his story, ones that have been struggling and on the fence, God, that are going to completely make the leap and run to you, God. I just thank you, God, for what you're doing. You're setting minds and hearts free right now in the name of Jesus. Amen.